let's put on our scuba gear and joining us here is Kara all the way live from Guam. Hey Kara, how are you? I'm great. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Thanks so much for joining us. So the floor is all yours. All right, awesome. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Like um, Peter said, I'm the National Coral Reef Management Fellow in Guam. And even though I'm the Coral Reef Management Fellow, I actually work more closely um, on our seagrasses and mangroves, which help support our coral reefs. So that's the um, focus of this talk is these connected marine ecosystems, the seagrasses, the mangroves, and the coral reef. So I'll start off with uh, the corals. So we'll dive right into a coral reef. Um, here you can see some brownish orange coral. These corals look pretty healthy. Um, so as you, as you may have already heard, corals are animals. They have a limestone skeleton inside them and they have algae that give them that color. And that algae helps them get energy from the sun. Um, but coral bleaching is occurring more frequently. Um, when this happens, the coral uh, releases its helpful algae. It turns a whitish color. And um, so in some cases, they can bring that algae back and recover. But if bleaching is too frequent, if we have too many um, really warm temperature water events, um, then the corals can bleach over and over and then eventually die. Um, and once they're dead, their skeletons can get colonized by different kinds of algae. You can see that here, some of the corals bleaching and some there, there's some algae growing in between them. So this is a problem that's happening in many places. Our corals, which have all these different shapes, are turning into more like algae. Um, forest is a picture in the South Pacific where it's just overgrown on the coral skeleton. And what does biodiversity have to do um, with this? How does it fit into this picture? Well, first of all, there's biodiversity of the corals, right? Um, different coral shapes are important for different animals to use. Um, their genetics might be different that help them be more resistant to that hot water or disease. Um, but I actually focused on my graduate work on more of the fish populations. So like I said, if corals are um, transitioning into seaweed forests, we need to make sure we have um, enough fish to eat that seaweed. Um, fish have different roles on the reef. Some are eating more like the corals themselves. Some are eating um, vertebrates, that parafish that's just swam away in the back. Um, it's scraping surfaces um, and letting new corals settle there. And then um, seaweed eating fish are really important too. And the diversity of them is important because if we have maybe a not so tasty seaweed um, and only one species can eat that seaweed, if we lose that species, then we've lost that functional role on the reef. Um, nothing else is gonna eat that seaweed and it will overgrow. On the other hand, if we have multiple species, then they can be kind of like backups for each other. So having that diversity is really important. And this is kind of diversity within one type of habitat. So fish within the coral reef, you might also say birds in the forest or reptiles in the uh, desert. Um, and then there's also, if we go down um, on a smaller scale, diversity within a microhabitat. So that might be within a clump of algae or under some leaf litter, all the little invertebrates um, or a water droplet, the bacteria inside of it. And then even smaller on the DNA level, like we talked about the genetic diversity is important. So they can be resistant to um, different conditions or disease. But I'm actually focused on a pretty broad level of diversity, the diversity of habitats. Um, so regionally connected ecosystems, the seagrasses, the mangroves and the corals, they're connected. Um, that's just one example. Another example might be um, salmon that connect the ocean with the land. So the salmon are swimming out to the sea where they grow up um, and then they bring all those nutrients back up the rivers when they go spawn and they feed the bears and um, other mammals and um, fertilize the forest. So really uh, important to think about uh, biodiversity also in the term of habitats. And I'll be focusing on the mangroves, seagrasses and corals. So mangroves a little more close to shore, um, seagrasses in shallow waters, usually often near shore and coral reefs um, sometimes near shore or a little bit farther out. Um, so what are mangroves? We talked a little bit about corals. So mangroves are trees that live in the intertidal environment. So that's between the high tide and the low tide. Um, they often have these really amazing root structures that come out of the ground um, and that helps them get air in these kind of um, low oxygen and uh, waterlogged sediments. And these roots are really, really amazing. Um, they're a great habitat for wildlife. You can see all these baby fish in Guam hiding between the, sea, uh, the mangrove roots and these oysters growing on them. Um, in Florida, also a great example, 
Um, here we have some big anemones growing on those roots and some sea squirts. So they're actually pumping in water and then pushing it back out and filtering that water on those sea squirts. Things eat those sea squirts, um, including this lined flatworm. Really, really cool. One of my favorite creatures you can find um, within the mangroves. Um, and also in this video is another mysterious green flatworm. I don't even know what kind it is. So within our mangroves, we've got a lot of diversity of stuff living on the mangrove fruits. And this is a sea spider, by the way, also something you can find. Um, sponges are another great filter feeder. So here I'm kind of presenting some different sponges. It almost looks like a fancy, like herbs collected or mushrooms or something. Um, we have a chicken liver sponge, a purple mangrove sponge, a blue mangrove sponge. Um, so even though people usually as, um, associate colorfulness with the coral reef, mangroves can be really amazingly colorful with all their sponges and algae that live on them. Um, even this little shrimp. And then that's only below water. Above water, we've got crabs, we've got birds, we've got reptiles. So mangroves themselves, they have pretty amazing biodiversity. Um, seagrasses, moving on to seagrasses. Uh, these are marine flowering plants. So they actually evolve from land back into the sea. Uh, the most common we have in Guam is called tape grass. Um, and here are examples of flowers. They don't really look like land flowers, very different. These are the male flowers, super, super tiny. Um, and they float on the surface of water to a female flower um, and fertilizes that female flower, pollinates it. And then um, this retracts and it just starts to develop a fruit. Uh, it's kind of like a spiky, hairy fruit. And the seeds inside are actually edible. So some people um, eat them. So this is very interesting way of um, reproduction. It's the only marine flower plant, seagrasses are. Um, and then within those seagrasses, you can find lots of amazing biodiversity as well. So this is one of my favorites, the sea lettuce slug. Um, it stores the chloroplast from plants it eats in its back in these ruffles, and that helps it get energy from the sun. So it's basically like a solar power slug. Um, and then this is also a solar powered jellyfish. The upside down jellyfish is having its tentacles facing the sun and the algae inside of those tentacles helps them get energy. A lot of times you don't see things in seagrasses as readily, a lot of them are small, but if you look closely you can find these amazing things like these brittle stars of all different shapes and colors. Um, so that's another thing if you explore the seagrass and mangroves you want to look closely. Um, and there's some larger things as well like stingrays, dolphins, turtles, so if you look at maps of where corals, mangroves, and seagrasses are, they often overlap. So we're talking about the connectivity again. Each of them separately have their amazing biodiversity, but when you add them together, it's even, they're like forming a synergy. Um, so within the Pacific, as well as the Atlantic. And why is this? Um, so because they provide different kinds of shelter, they offer different kinds of food. Um, so diversity of habitats offer lots of different like niches for animals. Here's an example of the Goliath grouper. It's a really iconic fish species in the Florida Keys. Um, it can grow like a thousand pounds over seven feet, really, really huge. Um, and even though you see them in the reef right now, they actually start off in the red mangrove environment. Um, so they need to move between those two habitats and utilize both of them. Other examples include snappers, dolphins, this scribbled rabbit fish. They might be moving between different habitats or different food. It's been proven through studies that some fish may shelter in the mangrove roots, but then go to the seagrasses to feed on the little things on the surface. Um, some predators might move around, and it's been shown that there's a greater diversity of coral reef fish when they're these seagrass and mangrove nursery habitats nearby. So that's a really important um, feature of how seagrasses and mangroves support our coral reefs. Um, coral reefs, corals might even seek refuge within the shade of mangroves. So this is a unique habitat in the Virgin Islands. You can see um, these mangroves getting some shade from the corals. And you can also see some seagrasses here, some sponges, um, there's some macroalgae. So uh, it's really, once again, everything is connected um, and it has an ecological role and connection with each other. Um, and then moving on, this also means that if we damage one habitat, it might also cause negative impacts to nearby habitats. So I'm going to zoom in on Guam a little bit more. Here's the island of Guam. Um, it's part of the Marianas Islands. The Marianas Trench is over here. Um, and we're going to zoom in on Cocos Island. So this little bit, or Cocos Lagoon, sorry, this little bit um, in the south. Uh, so here are some seagrasses. The corals would be along the edge and a little bit within the lagoon. And then the mangroves line the shoreline. And we're going to drop you 
right into the middle of the lagoon and pretend that you're looking towards the land. So what you'll see is this beautiful landscape of southern Guam, um, the mountains and the hills, and this is illustrating the importance of ridge to reef conservation. Uh, so we're protecting the whole watershed when we want to protect coral reefs. When it rains, um, that rain is going to flow through the terrestrial forest, the forest on land, then go through the mangroves, then the seagrasses, and finally reach the corals. And in each of these steps, um, the mangrove seagrasses, the forest, they're filtering that water to make sure the water quality is good for the corals. Um, in Guam, we have this problem with badlands and sedimentation. So what's happening here is fires often burn, and they burn the vegetation, they burn the plants. There's no roots holding those um, the sediment in place. When it rains, especially during the rainy season, all that sediment gets washed down the hills into the water. You can see this plume of sediment um, that can smother the coral, that can't feed as well. Here you can see multiple badlands um, from um, this view or from the sky. Um, so this is a big problem. And seagrasses and mangroves help a little bit with that problem. They help trap the particles and stabilize the sediment. So as the water flows through these roots or the seagrass blades, which are waving in the water, they help slow down that water and then things can settle out. All the animals living in there also produce mucus, think like snails and stuff. They're producing slime that helps aggregate the particles and helps them settle out as well. Um, another way, not just sediment, but another way that water quality harms corals is if we have sewage or nutrient pollution. So here are some examples of coral diseases that you can find in Guam. Um, and seagrasses can help with this as well. It's been shown in some studies that seagrasses can reduce the amount of bacteria in the water and even reduce the amount of coral disease. Mangroves even have been used around sewage plants to help absorb that nutrient pollution. So very, very important to protect our seagrasses and mangroves to protect our corals. Another new study even looked at microplastics. So here we can see little bits of plastic attached to the seagrass surface. So seagrasses and mangroves are even um, helping to absorb some of that plastic pollution. But again, that's not great for things eating the seagrass, right? Um, so they can absorb pollution, but we also want to make sure we take care of them as well. Um, and then another thing is mangroves, especially seagrasses too, but mangroves especially absorb tons of carbon. You can see in this chart that the mangroves are storing oh, a ton of carbon, even compared to the jungles or other types of forests. This is largely due to the mangroves going really, really fast underground. They have lots of um, roots and root hairs that rapidly um, regrow and they get buried in the sediment um, over really, really long time scales. This also means that if we cut down the mangroves, all that carbon gets released from the sediment that they were holding in place. Um, so how do seagrasses and mangroves support coral health? They provide nursery and feeding grounds. They improve water quality locally. That's something we can control a little bit easier on Guam. And then globally, they capture carbon and help reduce the impacts of climate change. Healthy coral seagrass and mangroves and forests, they're all working together. And that helps us as humans as well to provide fisheries and seafood, tourism, um, just amazing wildlife to look at. Right? So what kind of work are we doing in Guam to protect these connected ecosystems? As a natural resource manager, I'm working in all sorts of different fields. It's interdisciplinary. So we're looking at science research and monitoring. We're doing education. We're talking with people and the stakeholders, the people involved um, using these habitats, uh, potentially doing restoration, um, grant writing, securing funds, and then helping with other projects. So for instance, here we see um, a map of the seagrasses in southern Guam. The red represents really dense areas, um, orange um, kind of dense, and then yellow a little more sparse. And this was back in 2005. This pink represents areas of loss um, since 2005 to 2015. So 10 years later, we've lost seagrasses in these areas, unfortunately. So that's something that we want to um, monitor and better understand why this is happening. Is it due to storms? Is it due to pollution or fishing? Um, so that's part of the science aspect, seeing what's going on and trying to understand why. Another example of how the science is being used, here's the type of mangrove, the large leafed orange mangrove, um, and it's in both Guam and Saipan, the nearby island. And you can see in Guam, it gets much less visitors by pollinators than Saipan. And this is because in Guam, the brown, uh, invasive brown tree snake has eaten a lot of our birds. Most of the pollination would be done by the Micronesian honey eater, which has gone extinct in Guam. Unfortunately, so it's receiving this particular mangrove receiving, receiving a lot less pollination, and most of it is by insects, which aren't as efficient. So we might want to focus on efforts to 
um, restore this mangrove and see what we can do to help restore Micronesian honey eater populations and reintroduce them after we take care of the brown snake problem. Um, speaking of restoration, testing different techniques to grow mangroves and seagrasses so they stay anchored in place and don't wash away is really important. Um, sea level rise is something we wanna plan for. So as sea level rises um, due to climate change, the mangroves can get flooded and drown. Um, so they have two options when this happens. They can either accrete sediment, so collect sediment and kind of raise the sea level, or they can move backwards and retreat um, upland where the sea level is higher. If you have roads or development though, like we do have in Guam, then they can't, re they can't retreat and they can drown. So that's something we wanna measure, how much sediment are accreting, where should we restore? These are things that we plan for. Education and outreach is also really important, talking with students, talking with members of the public about um, what, their, what the importance of seagrasses and mangroves are and coral reefs, show them the amazing wildlife that there is, um, assist people in um, swimming activities so they can explore these environments and enjoy them responsibly. And then any kind of materials we create um, for classroom use, um, includes our multiple habitats, our mangroves, our seagrasses, and coral reef because they once are once again are connected. Uh, social science is another really important thing that we do in Guam to manage our resources. We want to understand how are people using these habitats, um, how often are they using them, what kind of seafood are they taking from them, also what kind of conservation measures are they supportive of? Do you think we should have more signs? Do you think we should have um, television ads or something like that? because um, they can tell us a lot of information about how we can help them protect these resources. Um, and then working with landowners is another important thing that we do. Um, here you can see some baby mangroves planted on um, some private land that was donated um, to, for preservation. Um, and this is really important because if we don't know what's gonna happen to the land and the landowner is not supportive of the work, then they can just chop down the mangroves after we re regrow them or chop down old mangroves as well. So that's another thing that um, we focus on as well. And then assisting with other projects is really important. Um, once again, everything's connected. So we help with um, forestry programs, seed dispersal, um, preventing wildfires, um, parks and rec. We work with them to install signs to educate people on how to interact with wildlife properly and not stand on corals and other um, or, uh, avoid other um, improper uses of the reef. So once again, I guess the message is everything is connected and we all have to take a holistic approach to conservation. So here are some references um, from the presentation and just want to say thank you really quickly to the Guam Department of Agriculture, Nova Southeastern University, and all these federal and local partners that help make this work possible. And with that, are there any questions? Thank you so much, Kara. That was really, really uh, so insightful and uh, wow, there's so much work that's currently being done, especially with mangroves. And I'm glad to see so much positive work being done because even here in Malaysia, we are facing, unfortunately, um, a severe problem with mangrove depletion. Um, and I was particularly interested in uh, what you brought up, um, planting mangroves on private land. Um, so tell me a little bit more. Is it an initiative that you that you've been doing for for some time? Have do you approach these landowners or do they approach you? Um, how does it work? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, definitely working with landowners can be complex. You have people that might have their own kind of like home property or their beach like um, holiday property, and then you have even like um, commercial property. Um, some of it submerged. Some of it is above land. Um, so my approach um, so far has been to actually do surveys and really listen to people. Um, we want to avoid like coming into the community and being like, this is what you should do. Like I know better than you, right? Conservation is teamwork. So we want to hear from them, like what have your experiences been? Um, what, do you, what do you think about your property? What are your plans for the future? And then how can we help? Maybe we can make some mutual goals. So this is um, kind of a new initiative and it's not just mangroves, also other native plants that we're trying to restore. Um, we kind of um, talk with landowners and then they connect us with other landowners who are interested and slowly it's like snowball um, growing um, interest in the program so that we can uh, work together to protect the, the their, their property and our mangroves. Yeah, and that's a brilliant way to, to go 
get about it because once they understand that the mangroves actually are there to protect their property and you know not not just from uh, 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 storm surge waves but also from soil erosion I think I think it will definitely make a lot of difference do you get a lot of state help um, in acquiring these pieces of land or or do they help you uh, get in touch with private landowners as well yeah, so um, there's the Guam Historic Preservation Trust, which is in charge of that particular um, property you saw in that picture. So they're kind of a partner. And then forestry, we work with them closely. Um, Guam Coastal Management Program. So yeah, there's a ton of teamwork that goes into um, making these connections with landowners and handling the different um, types of land, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, it was really, really insightful. Um, stay safe. And thank you so much for spending your time with us here. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I hope um, we continue a wonderful exploration of the biodiversity on this planet. Looking forward Absolutely. to it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs>